Thank you. That ends topical questions. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question one, Keza Dugdale. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Keza Dugdale. Thank you. A Facebook plea was recently made for volunteers to help under pressure NHS staff at the a &E Department of the Royal Alexandria Hospital in Paisley. Does the First Minister still think there isn't a crisis in Scotland's NHS? First Minister. Well, can I make very clear to Kezia Dugdale and indeed to members across the chamber the circumstances of the Facebook advert that Kezia Dugdale uh, talks about. NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde were seeking volunteers to offer a befriending service in the accident and emergency of the Royal Alexandria Hospital. Uh, NHS Glasgow has similar befriending volunteers working elsewhere in the hospital currently. These volunteers do not replace NHS staff they do not give any form of clinical care. Instead, they might accompany patients who are on their own and can provide general information to patients and to relatives. All health boards have volunteering policies and volunteers have provided support to patients in the NHS for many, many years. And I think this is a good opportunity for all of us across the chamber to thank the many people who volunteer in our national health service. President Officer, volunteers play a valuable role in our NHS, but there is no avoiding the fact that this is the first time the befriending service has been extended to A&E. And by God, you need a friend if you've been waiting 17 hours in an A&E department. I know from speaking to NHS patients and staff across Scotland that our health service is at breaking point. These are people who need treatment and the dedicated staff who provide it. They do a wonderful job, but they are struggling and they need support from their government. Can the First Minister tell us whether the rise in the number of acute patient cases in Scotland's NHS has been matched by staff increases? First Minister. There has been, I think, a 6.5% increase in the number of staff working in the National Health Service since this government took office. We are all well aware of the pressures on our National Health Service. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, when Kezia Dugdale and I had an exchange on the challenges that face our National Health Service in England, I explained then the increase in attendances, perfectly genuine attendances, that Greater Glasgow and Clyde in particular had been seeing at its accident and emergency units from very sick older people, many of them uh, frail elderly people with respiratory conditions. So we know the pressures yeah. that our health service is working under. That's why this government has been increasing funding for our health service. It's why we've been increasing the number of people who work in our health service. Only this week, the health secretary announced an additional £100 million to tackle the challenge of delayed discharge in our health service. So uh, we will continue to do everything we possibly can to support those working at the front line in our National Health Service. And it's perhaps because we work so hard to do that, presiding officer, that a poll this week found that twice the number of people in Scotland trust the SNP with the health service than trust Labour. Time and time again, the First Minister comes to this chamber to tell us about increased NHS staff numbers. And we heard it again there today, 6.5%. But the reality is that the number of acute NHS patients in Scotland has risen by more than 10%. That is an extra 1.4 million patient cases since 2007. Yet the number of NHS staff to treat these patients lags far behind. The Scottish Government's £30 million this year to tackle the problem of bed blocking is welcome, but it isn't enough, because tackling bed blocking isn't the whole picture. The problem isn't just at the back door, it's on the front line. Scottish Labour would use the Barnet Consequentials to set up a £100 million frontline fund to deliver more NHS patient services in the evenings and weekends where they are needed the most. Let's try that consensus thing again. Will she back Scottish Labour's plans for the NHS? First Minister. When, when Labour finally comes up with some coherent, costly plans for the National Health Service, then in the interest of consensus, I will be very happy to consider them in that open and constructive way. The fact of the matter is here, Labour's figures don't 
add up. Now, I don't know if Kezia Dugdale was listening to the debate we had on the budget bill yesterday. Jackie Bailey, uh, who I don't know if she's in the chamber right now, I can understand why she might have chosen not to be, uh, she spent most of her speech calling for additional money for local government. Yeah. And then when she was challenged to say where that money should come from, she said that was too complicated a question for her to answer. And then in the next breath, we had a call for more funding for the health service, again with figures that don't add up. So I will tell Kezia Dugdale what, as First Minister, I will continue to do. I will continue to provide real money for the National Health Service, real increases to the National Health Service from a real balanced budget that this government puts forward. We have increased the health budget in real terms since 2010 by 4.6%. Health boards, uh, territorial health boards next year will get above inflation increase of 3.4%. We will continue to deliver for the health service, working with them to address the challenges. And I say again, it's because we do that. It's because we stand with our health service to make sure it's equipped to deliver that 42% of people trust the health service, more than double, uh, trust the SNP to run the health service, more than double the number that trust Labour. <laughs> Officer, the First Minister has £113 million pounds worth of unallocated Barnet consequentials. Real, We're asking for £100 million pounds of it. Real That's real money to tackle a real problem, and it's about time she took responsibility for it. The SNP pat themselves on the back about the opinion polls, but over Christmas, a porta cabin, a porta cabin, was given a lick of paint and used as an integral part of our NHS. £30 million for bed blocking is welcome, but it won't make the Scottish Government's NHS crisis go away. Scottish Labour is putting the NHS first. When will the First Minister do the same? First Minister. We should provide money from unallocated consequentials to the health service. The only problem with that from Kezia Dugdale is she's also asking us to make money available for local government, for a resilience yes. fund, for a whole list Absolutely. of other things. So I gently, I gen well, if Kezia, Dugdale, if Kezia Dugdale is now saying it's not Labour's position for us to use the consequentials to set up a resilience fund uh, to help people in the North East economy, then that's a change in Labour's position, but I think she should clarify it. Can I come back? to the fundamentals here. This is about patients and staff in our National Health Service. Now, you know, Kezia Dugdale might want to talk about porta cabins, but I think what the people across the country, and certainly in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, will be interested to know is that a new hospital Absolutely. at a cost of £850 million pounds is close to being finally constructed in the City of Glasgow. The Finance Secretary visited it yesterday. That's the investment this government is putting into our health service. So we'll continue to invest real money from real budgets in our health service, supporting those at the front line, and frankly, we'll leave Labour to their own fantasy economics. Question, question two, Ruth Davidson. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I think I may just know the answer to this question, but to ask the First Minister when she'll next meet the Prime Minister. Oh. First Minister? Uh, in round about an hour's time. Yeah. Ruth Davidson. Thank you. Uh, yesterday, John Swinney announced that he was tearing up his previous rates and bans on the new land and buildings transaction tax and replacing them with more generous rates. He was able to do this because the Conservative-led government in Westminster had itself cut stamp duty, a cut which was reflected in Scotland's block grant. Can the First Minister tell me today, does she think this tax cut, helping homeowners across the UK and in Scotland, would have happened if Ed Miliband had been Prime Minister? <laughs> First Minister. <laughs> such a massive opportunity here to, to I, I suppose, reflect on what I think is a, a curiosity in, in Scotland, and Labour probably won't want to hear this. Uh, yesterday there was a poll published in Scotland that showed that Ed Miliband, a Labour leader in Scotland, has managed to find himself in a position where he has even lower approval ratings than a deeply popular Tory Prime Minister. I don't know how they've managed to do that, but nevertheless, and I think the answer to that question, for people who look at the Westminster establishment and don't fancy what they see from either side, the answer to that is to vote SNP and get strong voices standing up for Scotland. And now, on the question,
question of LBTT, I'm very proud that John Swinney yesterday put forward tax proposals that take out of taxation altogether in terms of house transactions 50% of people at the bottom end of the housing market. I think that's a fantastic achievement. It will help first-time buyers and I hope Ruth Davidson will warmly welcome it. Ruth Davidson. I warmly welcome appearing on the next Conservative leaflet to pop through doors. David Cameron is a deeply popular Prime Minister, <laughs> so says the First Minister of Scotland. But it's strange, First Minister, that Officer, this is a First Minister who will happily pass on a Conservative tax cut and yet is the same First Minister who wants to help Ed Miliband get into Downing Street so that she can stop just such tax cuts taking place. But let me ask a point of detail about yesterday's stamp duty reforms. When John Swinney first announced his rates in October, he said, and I quote, I have decided that the taxes raised should be revenue neutral raising no more or less than the taxes that they replace. And he repeated that principle several times yesterday in this very chamber. Following the Chancellor's tax cut, the Deputy First Minister had an additional £64 million to pass on in yesterday's budget. His climb down, however, only amounts to £53 million. And those numbers were confirmed to us by the Scottish Parliament's own independent information service this morning. So that's an extra £11 million that will have to be paid by home buyers in Scotland. So my question is, why has this First Minister not passed on the full £64 million to Scottish taxpayers as promised, and what is she planning to do with the other £11 million? First Minister. The answer to that, of course, uh, is very simple, and I'm sure John Swinney would uh, be very happy to write in detail providing the answer, but I'll give it to her right now. Uh, the tax changes announced by John Swinney yesterday are revenue neutral and we of course had to wait for the detail of the block grant adjustment but there are two other factors uh, that John Swinney has been very open about taking into account. The effect of forestalling and also uh, John Swinney's uh, indication of which he made earlier as well that a contribution will be made to the reserve. So that is the definition that he has always given of revenue neutrality and I'm sure the Finance Secretary will be very happy to set out the detail of that in writing to Ruth Davidson. Can I say finally uh, two uh, other points uh, to Ruth Davidson? I'm glad she's given me the opportunity today to say uh, very clearly again uh, that the SNP would not, in any circumstances, formally or informally, prop up a Tory government because Scotland doesn't vote Tory and I don't see that changing any time soon. But the last point, presiding officer, applies both to Ruth Davidson and to Kezia Dugdale. Isn't it rather strange that on the day the UK government are publishing their draft legislation legislative clauses supposedly implementing the Smith proposals, we don't have Labour or the Tories with a gumption to stand up here and say that the vow's been delivered because they know it's not. Thank you. Can the First Minister tell us, is it true that contractors working on the new women's prison project in Greenock will be told tomorrow that the project is not now going ahead. First Minister. Well, as uh, Murdo Fraser is aware, uh, Michael Matheson has said he's considering uh, this issue very carefully, and I think it is absolutely correct uh, that as a new Justice Secretary he takes the time to do that. It will not come as any surprise to anybody in this chamber to know that it's an issue Michael uh, Matheson and indeed myself as First Minister and the government have been looking at carefully because we want to make sure uh, that the decision that is taken here is the right decision. Um, and I also want to make clear that uh, my view is that all of us across this chamber should be determined to work to reduce not just the prison population generally, but the female prison population in particular. So I'm sure when Michael Matheson finally makes uh, the announcement after his consideration, Murdo Fraser will be interested in that matter, and I would hope that he will welcome whatever decision we finally arrive at. Question three, Will Rennie. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Will Rennie. We know the First Minister wants independence at all costs and at every opportunity. But that is not what the people voted for last September or for what her party agreed to with Smith. So it's a pity this morning she has gone on a hunt for reasons to be miserable. The vow has been made, delivered on time, 
This is Order. Won't she join Order. the people Let's hear Mr. who Rainey. believe in partnership and say this is a good day for the Scottish Parliament? First Minister. On the basis of uh, recent opinion polls, there are certainly some people in this chamber who have good cause to be pretty miserable, but can I give them a clue? It's nobody on these benches, that's for sure. Um, can I, in all, all seriousness, and let me engage uh, in a very straight way with Willie Rennie on this issue. Um, of course, it's no secret that I didn't think the Smith proposals went far enough. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I do welcome the proposals as far as they go. And I think it is really important now that both the spirit and the letter of those proposals are translated into legislation. Uh, I welcome the draft clauses today and as far as they go, but I think in some key respects there has been a significant watering down of what the Smith Commission uh, proposed. I cannot believe that Willie Rennie is going to stand up here and argue that in any circumstances it can be right for Westminster to retain a veto on whether or not this Parliament can abolish the bedroom tax. And I also don't believe Willie Rennie will agree with the fact that even although the Smith Commission said we should have a general power to create new benefits in any devolved area, that's not actually being delivered. So Willie Rennie should stop swallowing the Tory line in this, instead get behind the Scottish Government and try and strengthen the proposals. Willie Rennie. Can I just gently say to the First Minister that in Smith, she agreed to share the universal credit with the UK Government. Now she wants to exclude the people she agreed to share with. Doesn't she realise how ridiculous she sounds? All we have to agree is a start date for the new Scottish system. That's not a veto. It's government working together. It's basic common sense. So can I ask her? when she will honour her part of the Smith Agreement and extend devolution to local communities. Two months since Smith and there's been no action whatsoever. Last week, her most senior backbencher, Joan McAlpine, said that those who want to devolve power to local councils want to bring down this parliament. Is that why she is dragging her feet? First Minister. But I am very committed to devolving power away from this parliament. That's why we've done the work we've done with cities. Okay. It's why we've done the work uh, we've done and continue to do with our island communities. But I don't think it's reasonable for Willie Rennie to say that we should be devolving away powers proposed by the Smith Commission before the UK government has even got round to giving this parliament the powers in the first place. Now, let me just quote the draft clause to Willie Rennie. Before this parliament could make regulations to abolish the bedroom tax, we would a have to consult with the UK Government about the practicability of those regulations and the Secretary of State would have to give his or her agreement as to when that change could be made. Now, I'm sorry if Willie Rennie Order. can't understand this, but when you require the agreement of another person to do something, then that person tends to have a veto. Now, I I'm prepared to make common cause with Willie Rennie on this. Let us go together to the UK Government and ask for that draft clause to be changed. And if they agree to change it, then we'll have made real progress. Question number four, Jimmy Dave. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to reduce the incidence of type 2 diabetes among children and adolescents. First Minister. In order to reduce the incidence of type 2 diabetes in children and adolescents, it's essential that we address the underlying risk factors associated with the development of this condition. Our obesity strategy, which was published in 2010, sets out our long-term commitment to tackling overweight and obesity. Uh, and additionally, in January 2011, we published our framework to improve maternal and infant nutrition. From a broader perspective, our diabetes improvement plan, which was published in November last year, contains actions designed to improve the early detection of people of all ages at risk of developing type 2 diabetes. 
I thank the First Minister for that answer, but with one in seven children in Scotland now classed as being either obese or overweight, I welcome the priority being placed on measures to prevent more children being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. But what more can be done to encourage school pupils to become healthy and more active by promoting cycle lessons, walking to and from school and providing greater emphasis within the curriculum on physical education and healthy, healthy eating? And what more can be done to provide a determined and concerted focus in our most deprived areas? First Minister. Uh, the Government is committed to doing all we can for children and young people to stop more children being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Health and wellbeing is a core part of curriculum for excellence in Scottish schools and across all learning stages. It mandates that children and young people should enjoy daily opportunities to participate in physical activity and sport. Uh, the 2014 Healthy Living Survey uh, shows that schools are delivering, 96% of schools are delivering at least two hours physical education in primary schools and at least two periods in secondary secondary schools and that demonstrates remarkable progress since 2004-05 when less than 10% of schools were meeting this target. David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will be well aware that the chances that uh, the issues about type 2 diabetes at a young age increases the chances of complications spiralling, including heart and kidney disease and even premature death. But up to 80% of cases of type 2 can be delayed or preventive through lifestyle changes. Does the First Minister share the view of Diabetes Scotland of a future without diabetes by funding research into new treatments and teaching children the importance of a healthy diet and regular exercise? First Surely Minister. our aim should be a country free of Scotland's silent killer. First Minister. Uh, yes, I do agree with that very strongly. I would also take the opportunity to commend the work of Diabetes Scotland and we uh, look forward to continuing to work with them so that we can improve uh, prevention, early diagnosis and uh, in doing so uh, enable us to limit some of the damaging effects later in life that Dave Stewart has spoken about. So I look forward uh, to working across this chamber on the actions that I've spoken about and indeed in other actions uh, so that we can and look forward to Scotland without diabetes. Question number five, Ken McIntosh. Uh, thank you. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government has taken to reassure the Jewish community following recent terrorist attacks and the reported rise in anti-Semitism. First Minister. Uh, following the atrocities in Paris, I spoke with the Director of the Scottish Council of the Jewish Communities on the 16th of January to offer the condolences and support of this Government to the Jewish community in Scotland. Tackling anti-Semitism is a key priority for the Scottish Government and we continue to work closely with organisations representing the Jewish community. Uh, most recently, we've provided funding to the Scottish Council to explore how attitudes to being Jewish in Scotland have changed in the last year. And I hope this work as part of our programme of support shows our clear commitment to countering intolerance. We'll also continue to work through Interfaith Scotland, which works to promote dialogue and through education, eliminate religious intolerance as well as improve the lives of all of our faith communities communities in Scotland. On 27th of January, I will attend the National Scottish Holocaust Memorial event at 2015 in Ayr to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau. I will also be signing the Book of Commitment in the Scottish Parliament, pledging the support of the Scottish Government to keep the memory alive of what can happen if we allow hatred, prejudice and intolerance to remain unchecked. Ken McIntosh. Thank you, President Officer. Can I thank the First Minister for her comments and the commitment uh, she is showing on behalf of the Scottish Government? Uh, can I ask her whether she would agree that our reaction should not be one of alarmism but one of reassurance? Uh, could I also suggest one way of signalling that solidarity with the Jewish community that we wish to show? Uh, the First Minister issued a very welcome statement condemning the horrific attack on the kosher supermarket in Paris, just as she did condemning the Charlie Hebdo uh, massacre. But unlike the statement condemning the Charlie Hebdo attack, uh, which has been put on the Scottish Government's website, her statement to the Jewish community has not yet been put on the Scottish Government's website. It's quite important that as well as offering reassurance directly to the Jewish community, there, there is a public display of that message. And I would ask the First Minister to think of those comments. First Minister. I'm certainly more than happy to uh, take that on board and, and to rectify that if that is indeed is an omission. I, can I take the opportunity to assure Ken McIntosh if it is an omission, it is not a deliberate one and it's obviously been um, an oversight, but I will ensure that is rectified. On the first part of Ken McIntosh's uh, question there, I absolutely agree and indeed it was uh, something that uh, I heard also from the Director of the Scottish Council of Jewish Communities. It is very much a case of uh, uniting together in solidarity 
uh, but resisting alarmism and instead taking every opportunity that we can to reassure those in our Jewish community. Uh, we're very lucky in the diversity of the country we've got, uh, Presiding Officer. The Jewish community in Scotland play a massive role in this country. Uh, they make a massive contribution to our country. Uh, we are very proud of that and we should all stand shoulder to shoulder with them at this time. Stuart Maxwell. I very much welcome the comments that the, the, the First Minister has just provided and hopefully the reassurance to the Jewish community in Scotland. But can I ask, given uh, in light of the comments by the Home Secretary about security at, uh, at both synagogues and schools down in England uh, about, after the incidents in, in France, can the First Minister provide reassurance about the additional security measures that will be provided to the Jewish community, particularly synagogues, uh, social clubs and, of course, Calderwood Lodge, the primary and the secondary school, where Jewish pupils go to in East Renfrewshire. First Minister. Um, can I thank uh, Stuart Maxwell for that answer? Both the Justice Secretary and I have had a briefing from the police on uh, some of these specific matters. Uh, and I can assure uh, members across the chamber that Police Scotland are aware of the need to ensure that the reassurance and support given to local Jewish communities also encompasses our universities and will be working uh, with university chaplaincies, with other organisations, um, to make sure that that is the case. Uh, and uh, similarly with schools, uh, the safety of pupils attending school is of paramount importance to us and to local authorities uh, and indeed to the police. The police recognise the concern of some Jewish communities and I can assure uh, people across the chamber that they will be undertaking a range of measures, not just to provide reassurance, uh, but to provide tangible reassurance. Uh, and I have no doubt that that uh, will be a welcome message uh, to everybody who, like me, uh, wants to send out a very clear message that we will not tolerate in any way, shape or form the intolerance and prejudice uh, that, unfortunately, some uh, people in our faith communities are subject to. Jackson Carlow. Underpinning all of this, does the First Minister agree that whatever disagreements individuals may have with the day-to-day -day policy of the State of Israel, this should not be conflagrated with the Jewish community here in Scotland and must never be allowed to justify the abuse or intolerance that unfortunately sometimes it appears it is used to do? First Minister. Yes, I agree wholeheartedly. And you know, just as the wider Muslim community are in no way, shape or form responsible for the kind of atrocities we saw in Paris, so too is it true that the wider Jewish community is not responsible uh, for any of the actions uh, of the Israeli government. So whatever people's views uh, are or are not uh, about Israel, uh, that is not uh, something that is the responsibility of the Jewish community here in Scotland. Uh, I want to see us in Scotland, and I believe everybody in Scotland wants to see this, all of our wonderfully diverse communities coming together uh, and showing, demonstrating in how we behave and how we carry ourselves that we are indeed, whatever differences there might be between us, we are one Scotland. Question number six. Bill Kidd. That's me, yeah. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact the renewal of Trident would have on the delivery of public services in Scotland. First Minister. Well, the equivalent annual cost of Trident renewal is estimated by the Trident Commission at £2.9 billion pounds per annum. That's at 2012 prices. How Scotland's 8.3 population share of these costs, which equates to around £240 million pounds per year across the lifetime of the proposed successor programme, could be better used, would of course be a matter for the government to determine at the time. But let me make it clear that rather than spending billions of pounds on weapons of mass destruction, this Scottish Government would want to use our proportion of that money to help Scotland continue its journey to becoming a fairer and more prosperous country. Bill Kidd. I thank the First Minister for that, uh, for that reply and would just ask if the First Minister is as shocked as me that just a week after voting with the Tories to impose £30 billion more austerity cuts, the great majority of Scottish Labour MPs backed another £100 billion in public resources for new nuclear weapons. First Minister. The, the really sad thing is I am actually no longer shocked when Scottish Labour decide to decide, uh, side with the Tories instead of siding with the people of Scotland. We've seen it in the referendum campaign. We saw it last week when Labour voted with the Tories for an additional £30 billion of austerity cuts. And just this week, uh, 
aside from a handful of honourable uh, members of the Scottish Labour Party, most members, MPs from the Scottish Labour Party, either didn't bother to turn up and vote against Trident, or indeed they voted with the Tories for the renewal of Trident. Yet more evidence, presiding officer, if it were needed, that the only party that can be trusted to stand up for Scotland is the SNP. Thank you. That ends First Minister's questions. We now I have a point of order from Murdo Fraser. Order. Thank Mr. you, Fraser. Standing officer, I wish to raise a point of order in relation to the answer given to me earlier by the First Minister in connection with the future of the proposed women's prison project in Greenock. Given your own statement to uh, Parliament on Tuesday in relation to communications and announcements made by the Scottish Government being made first to the press and not as they properly should to Parliament, how can you assist members who wish to see further information in this area being announced as it properly should to Parliament and not in some other fashion? Thank you for that point of order. Can I say that there are a number of ways that um, government ministers can inform Parliament um, about their actions when it is a matter of significance? There are five different ways to do that. I'm sure that um, Mr Fraser is well aware of them, and I'm quite sure the government is too. That ends First Minister's questions. Point of order, Willie Rennie. Um, on a point of order, President Officer, the First Minister earlier in a response to me selectively quoted the draft clauses published by the UK Government today. She read the start, but not the end, of Clause 24B. In full, it reads, the Secretary of State has given his or her agreement as to when any change made by the regulations is to start to have effect. Such agreement not reasonably and unreasonably withheld. This is a very serious matter. Can I seek your advice, President Officer, on how the First Minister can correct the record and correct the selective misquoting? Mr Wright, First Minister, would you like to... Again, uh, the clause that Willie Rennie has done, the Secretary of State has given his or her agreement as to when any change made by the regulations is to start to have effect, such agreement not to be unreasonably withheld. So, in other words, before a change such as the abolition of the bedroom tax can be introduced by this government, the Secretary of State at Westminster has to give his or her agreement. Now, that seems pretty clear to me. I'm not sure what bit Willie Rennie doesn't understand. Thank you. That does end First Minister's questions. We now move to the next item of business, which is members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.